Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the Dead by Daylight of Extreme Metal Podcasts. I am the Death Metal Guy, aka Sign Erected on Euronymous's Grave, reading Please Bro Revive, I Have Ray Gun. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I am Hyper Shaman, aka Proscriptor McBud Ice. Why, 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 okay. I hope the black metal guy has a really good excuse this time. Why are you back again? Okay, so, like, the past week, every single day I get a message from him where he's like, Hey, dude, I have a show tomorrow, and, and like, I need you to fill in. And then he just sends the same message over and over. I don't know if he's stuck in some sort of time loop or what's going on. Has that ever happened before? Oh, God, no, it hasn't, but I think he's been watching a lot of Melancholy of Haruhi Suzy Moya, so he might be in an endless eight scenario, but a, a horrible sort of necromantic black metal version. Uh, I guess I guess we're just going to have to do this show without... Oh, Jesus Christ, this, this fucking bit. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, guys. I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> so we're okay. Uh, so a uh, real story tied over episode for all of you waiting. Uh, we've been on summer break for a couple weeks now. Uh, the black metal guy is a little bit caught up in work more than anticipated. So uh, it's going to be a little bit more extended than it typically is. But we decided, hey, let's do a, a show between the death metal guy and our terminus intern hyper shaman just to tide you guys over. And don't worry, I, I know a lot of people are going to hear this intro and think, well, I can click the X on my tab right now because it's another slam episode, but I promise this time we have stuff that's possibly actually relevant to the audience's interests. Is that is that fair? This is like a more reasonable episode. <laughs> oh, no, th th this is this is much more uh, palatable to the masses. Main Mainline Terminator stuff. Yeah, right. Like, mm. you know, I mean, maybe not to your like average joe but to to a terminator this is palatable yeah this this makes per, perhaps sense. even perhaps even easy listening <laughs> yeah. um, no, there's well we don't have the black metal guy to bring some like scratchy pagan record that only features no. two riffs for an hour exactly so. this is this is pretty pretty uh three three different kinds of death adjacent or death metal i mean i i guess i consider grind jeff death, death adjacent yeah that's fair um so uh we're gonna get into it shortly and i know what you guys are thinking it's like why would i why would i continue to fund a a podcast that can't stay true to its own schedule and the reason is because we're still better than everyone so if you want to uh you don't have any other options <laughs> exactly what are you what are you gonna do what are you gonna do listen to whatever decibel is putting out give me a fucking break guys <laughs> all right so uh if you want to uh follow us for up to the minute updates on what <laughs> Uh, your host are up to the minute like like we ever post um you can follow us on facebook uh me the death metal guy on facebook at uh terminus podcast or the black metal guy when he is out of his time loop on instagram at terminus extreme metal and then uh if you're impressed <laughs> by one of your hosts remaining within material reality to tide you guys over uh, as everything is worked out in the time loop. You can fund us on Patreon. Uh, $3 and up gets you access to the Terminus Prime bonus episodes. Uh, $5 and up gets you access to the Terminus Black Circle. And $10 and up gets you voting access uh, within a, a, a deeper concentric circle of the Terminus Black Circle <laughs> uh, to be able to choose what the those bonus episodes are about but with the black metal guy gone let's listen to some grindcore hey all this is brandon from cromley and you're listening to terminus all right boys our first record of the night is something that uh, probably a lot of you out there were anticipating i certainly was uh and this is the newest record by singapore's own worm rot titled hiss out on earache records which are which is still a label apparently <laughs> we we yeah. we hear about infrequently so uh for those who aren't in the loop worm rot is i would say at this point 
outside of, you know, the most obvious huge legends like Napalm Death, probably like the uh, the last quote unquote mainstream grind band worthy of any sort of respect. <laughs> what, what, is that is that a fair assessment? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're the yeah they're they they were kind of late to the curb, so I guess curve, so I guess they still. But I don't know. I, I guess what's their first album? Two thousand. I mean, they've been around. They've been around for you know going on kind of like twenty years at this point. But I, I don't oh, think God. they really. Oh, no, not that long. 2007 is when they put out their first demo. Um, I would say they didn't really start to get their feet under them until, like, their second album, Dirge, in 2011. Yeah. And then they really blew up with Voices in 2016. Yes, um, that's that's the album I always saw. I mean, honestly, this band is new, more new, newer to me. I mean, I guess maybe when I was first getting into Grind, I purposefully avoided all the big names because I'm like... Oh, that's popular. Why would I listen to that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh no, I <laughs> so, get it. Yeah. So then, so then when I, but then you know, I start to realize, okay, popular doesn't equal bad, always. So you know, I'll check it out. And yeah, I mean, it's the first couple of albums are you know respectable, kind of more crusty, more on the crusty side of grind than death. Mm-hmm. I find, and then yeah, voices get some um, a little more interesting, a little more uh, uh, so, a little melody here and there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that they are, in a sense, kind of the um, continuation of the legacy of, like, really early Nazem, like Inhale, Exhale, yes. or maybe yes. even, like, a Circle of Dead Children in their Some more straightforward the, moments. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe maybe kind of a weird thing to say, but, like, cleaner grind, like, more... Yeah, yeah. Like, professional sounding... Yeah, I mean, they are, like I said, kind of the only well-known grind band. Yeah. In, in a scene where Full of Hell is now a flagship grind band somehow, no, Wormrod don't, is actually... Don't, don't say that. Don't say that name in front of me. I don't want to talk. I don't want to hear about Full of Hell. <laughs> no, oh my God. Buddy, none of us do, but this is the world we no. live in. <laughs> you, you go, you yeah, go to... we... You, you you can't ignore it forever. You you go to battle with the army you have, not the one you want, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, but anyway, oh, so yeah. so Wormrot, it's been uh, six years since uh, Voices in 2016, and I, oh, I, wow. I I think it's fair to say that Voices is probably their their best work thus far. So I was yeah. really looking forward to the new one. Uh, we don't cover a ton of grind on the show, but I'm always interested when something you know relevant pops up. Um, so Hiss is out, and it seems to be getting, like, surprisingly divisive opinions from the uh, the general audience. Um, like, I, obviously, a lot of people are super into it. Uh, I, I said in the notes, this will definitely be, like, top five for metal on Rate Your Music by the end of the year. And it's actually top seven of all albums, period, right now. So <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, I... I, for for some horrid reason, subject myself to the website Rate Your Music. I have an account there. <laughs> you know and the culture yeah, very well. Yeah, I, I know the culture. I know the kind of people that are here. And yeah, it's it's this was bound to be big on Rate Your Music. Yeah, and, uh, and what that means... For better or for worse. Yeah, and what it means when you're big on something like Rate Your Music and you're in an extreme genre, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad, but it definitely means that it's pointing toward a certain kind of audience. It, um, it's... it's. I don't, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm reaching for an idea or a word. I don't want to say, like, it's not just artsy or experimental, but, like... It's kind of like it's it's record collector core. Yeah, it's it's very. There's enough significant moments on it of of something different. You know, when you look at like a grind record, you usually get a nice slab of of, of a single substance, if not one or two substances. Mm-hmm. You know, you're get you're getting like a, a a concrete block of music. Yeah. And and rate your music likes it when when their music is like a, a mishmash of different materials that like it may make sense it may make they they like it when things are 
uh, like a, a, a little eclectic, a little. Um, yeah, they really value they like it when things. Yeah, it's like ooh, it's a little quirky. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, because if it's a like literally like any black metal album, that's just like normal black metal, which you know hun- hundreds and hundreds of bands that all have their own individual sound. You'll see some dude in the comment box that's just like. Oh, it's just another Dark Throne clone, and it will it will, it sound, will sound nothing like nothing Dark Throne. Like Dark Throne. Yes. Yes, the yes. only thing it has in common with Dark Throne is is blasts and trem riffs, yeah. which is because it's just black metal. But because it's made <laughs> out of that single material and doesn't have the like the like standout little quirkiness or eclecticism, it, it they just lump it in with oh, it's just a blah 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 clone because yeah. it's normal for that genre. Even yeah, I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, it's it's a website for people who dabble in a lot exactly. of different genres. It's 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 for people who like to be like, yeah, it's for people who want to be like, yeah, I list, you know, oh, what kind of music you listen to? Oh, everything, and yeah, that includes hip hop and country, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and, and they really you did they, the joke before I could. <laughs> nice. Yeah, exactly. They they want they want to have their topsters chart that has like you know oh, every single album is a different genre or something because I guess it makes them a more uh, fuller person. I, yeah. I I really don't know. I don't quite get it. Well, all this being said, um, so yeah, obviously, RWAM. D- RYM does not pride itself on the sort of rigorous homogeneity that yes. we tend to value on this show for extreme metal. Mm-hmm. And Hiss is a record that um, definitely plays into that. It is to a degree very eclectic. I would argue that there's really there's really only about like four ideas going on on this record. Yeah, there there there's not too many major modes it's in. It 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 only switches between a couple. Like but the way it switches between them uh, tends to be very sudden and very abrasive and tends to signal to the listener in a way yes. that internet music people really like. Um, it, it lacks a certain subtlety with its transitions, absolutely. Yeah. So, so overall, I would say, and we probably have similar feelings on this, I don't hate this record I think that it's oh, no. a sort of a paradoxical step backward for Wormrot. Um, and I think that a lot of the things that people find most special about this record, uh, especially, you know, kind of the, the most melodic moments, um, the most quote unquote experimental moments, um, I will say when Wormrot's in that mode on this record, it is very good. The flip side to that is they're very good because there are moments that you already hear in Swarm. And you have heard from them for about 20 years. Um, Exactly. Hiss is basically Wormrot announcing that they want to, to some degree, go down the Screamo grind rabbit hole. Um, uh, Clearly, this is a record heavily influenced by all the classics of like Japanese Screamo, you know, your your envies and whatnot, and probably Swarm very directly. Um, And I have no problem with that. I mean, I've been... You know, I've been quoted on the show many times as saying I love that style and I, I tend to really enjoy the kind of, uh, uh, you know, screamo interlaced black and grind stuff. But I, I guess the issue is a matter of degree. Um, Wormrot on this record doesn't lean into that enough. And Not at uh, all. I think they, that I think that you had some pretty salient points in your notes uh, about that, like the the actual nature of how they execute those ideas in these songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think they. I I don't know, like how consciously, you know, how conscious of an emotion this was to him, but the music it almost feels like they 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 were a little they were a little afraid to go full sack into it. Mm-hmm. Like, like, oh, like, Wormrot has a brand. They have yeah. a sound. Kind of, yeah, essentially, they have their own sound. And it's like, I don't know if they wanted to, from one record to another, do that massive degree of a change. I don't know how uh, conscious of a, of a thought that was to them. Maybe they, maybe it's just how it happened. Maybe they actually sat down and thought, well, let's not go too crazy right away. But uh, I kind of wish they did go that crazy right away. I, I really yeah. wish they took it farther because, like you said, those 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 more uh, like non worm rot sounding moments were the coolest moments. 
Yeah, they certainly were. And I think that I, I think the problem is this sort of um, anxious musical conservatism that's kind of limited this mm-hmm. record in, in the attempt to maintain the worm rot ban- brand and not alienate listeners. Uh, it's resulted in songs and an album as a whole that sounds very disjointed. Uh, there are definite senses to me that in the, the moments that sound the most worm rot quote unquote are also the parts that sound like they're going through the motions the most. Yes. It, it sounds like, okay, so we're going to play our grind riff. And yeah, that sure was a grind riff. You, you sure <laughs> are grindy. I mean, like, I've heard it before. You yeah, know? They, um, it's it's just, it's connective tissue to get to those kind of yes. experimental melodic parts. Yeah, it's it's just your train from point A to point B. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's uh, and I mean, I'm sure it doesn't necessarily help. And I mean, I, maybe this isn't a bad, a good term because I doubt there's, you know, Buku bucks in it, but being with like a quote unquote old money metal label probably mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily help. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you it's, know, it, it's it's like when you had you know those uh, those maggot stomp bands that were like, oh, this demo is kind of cool, and then they joined Century Media and their album sucked. Yeah, there. I mean, there's. A, I mean, it's it's such a, a standard argument. It's almost like a meme at this point. But there is something to it that something yeah. does get lost in translation. Exactly. I mean, I mean, voices itself was still on earache, but it felt like there wasn't as much leaning into the zeitgeist as there is on hiss. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that being said, let me play some stuff that I do really like. Uh, I'm yes. going to play a, a, a block of tracks, uh, tracks six through eight, which are unrecognizable, hatred transcending, and doomsayer. Um, so uh, as we've discussed on the show a few times, a lot of grindcore records tend to sort of accidentally create suites of songs that are clearly supposed to be listened to all as a single idea. Um I think that definitely happens on this album, and here it happens very deliberately. Like, listening to this section of tracks, this sort of closes out what I would call the first act of the record. And the execution and the way these three tracks flow into each other, I think is actually pretty excellent and really speaks to how talented Wormrot really are just as grindcore songwriters.
So, yeah, uh, I really like the way that suite of songs is executed. You know, you've got unrecognizable, just a little 10 second micro track, which is basically an extended fill or like an intro to Hatred Transcending. Mm -hmm. Uh, The back half of Hatred Transcending has that uh, extended kind of noise ambient part. And then it concludes with Doomsayer. Um, And I really like the way everything wraps up. Following that is a track called Pale Moonlight, which is another sort of weird ambient thing with, you know, some tribal drumming and some vocals. Um, And that kind of forms the first third of the record, everything up to that. And that's really cool. You get to hear Worm Rot kind of in their traditional mode, playing those kind of crusty grind riffs, but with a a technical ability that a lot of these bands don't have. Um, You get little snatches of the newer melodic focus and everything. Um, And you just have the, you know, that that sort of traditional breakneck uh, change in tone quality that's essential to any good grindcore. So, this is a really good section. However, mm-hmm. in Doomsayer, you point out something that happens that becomes this sort of, I don't know, it just like almost poisonous aspect of this record of the, yeah. the failure to commit. Yeah, it's like it's like you see they they do the grind, da, 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 you know that's just that that ringing da, 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 big kind of like major key like, emo like gesture, yeah the yeah. major key like they're gonna build up and then all of a sudden oh like they're gonna go straight into like the the this big cathartic swarm thing and then they no they just drop back down into like grind then the song ends and it's like oh like what uh, okay. And I this guess. is, I, I guess, I go, okay, thanks. <laughs> and this is something that happens continuously yeah, across it's, it's the Yeah, it's really disappointing. It makes me, it's like, it's kind of sad. Like, you're, it's like it's withholding affection. Uh, across this record, Wormrod is continuously blue balling the listener by. It, yeah, exactly. No, that, yeah. that's it. That's the word I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're... Like, like, oh, come on, dude. Oh. <laughs> They're consistently do the, do the thing, Jesus. They're oh. gesturing toward this huge melodic money shot, yeah. but it's really not until the very end of the record that they pull it off. And this is a pretty long record in grindcore terms. I mean, this is over half an hour long, and yeah. <laughs> it just it, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, at, at this kind of intensity, yeah, that's a long time to listen to something continuously. And it's also it's not a record that has like individual standout songs. Like all these songs interact with each other in admittedly really cool ways, but it, it basically becomes impossible to isolate certain songs as being essential. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I guess the question is like, why? Why pull back from the moment they're clearly seeking all the time? <sighs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know if once again, if they're like they they don't want to commit to it because they don't want too much change too quick. With you know what is worm rot? What's what's our shtick? I don't know if they, you know what's I I I don't know the way I keep coming back to thinking like they just they don't want to, they still want to be what what people think worm rot is. Which is interesting because I could totally see. Um, even earlier worm rot as going in this direction eventually like this is not yeah. a transition that comes as a complete surprise I mean there were little touches of it on voices already yes. and just and just in general a a grindcore band moving from early kind of aggressive cross grind stuff into a more melodic sort of emo inflected dimension I mean that's yeah. that's not a brand new transition <laughs> we've been around no, for a while I, mean, you know? I just I, I mean, these guys, I mean, these these are, and I mean, well, I guess that these guys are, I don't know if they're going to be anymore, because I what one of the main guys left, right? A vocalist this, left, yeah. Yeah, a riff. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's, you know, they're, they're legit guys, they've been around, they, they're, they're cool grind guys, but the album is, just like, I mean, like I said in the notes, the album's a bit hip, it's a bit, yeah. you know, it's very, it's very trendy for the modern uh i I guess quote-unquote underground music listener under underground compared to the vast majority of music listeners i mean i i feel like like and once again like i said in the notes i feel like there was a way they could have done this 
where, you know, like you said, like, it's not a lot of modes. They maybe have, like, you know, three, four, five different ways they do things. I feel like they could have stuck to, stuck to like, two or three. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, really, like, pare it down. Um, just, you know, do your, your, your grind, your crusty stuff, and lean harder into that melodicism. Yeah. Because that would have been really cool. And yeah. I wouldn't be sitting here going, oh... <laughs> oh, <laughs> why? Why won't you just let me have it? You know, yeah. but, give me, give me the cool thing. Well, Damn it. well, give me, uh, give me yours because I think you've got another instance of this happening. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Where it, it, yeah, this um, from uh, voiceless choir. Um, once again, ki- kind of an eclectic, little eclectic track, but um, definitely kind of acts like it's gonna do one thing and then just kind of maybe not says fuck you and does something else but it it definitely does something else and it doesn't feel you know fantastic so uh, this is voiceless choir Why can't I just have the thing that... And then you have your, you know, <laughs> you know, big, big dude doing his two-step on the, on the stage, and then they're all, yeah, gang shouts, which, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I, I don't understand, because it's like, that, that is just, okay, I understand that grind thrives off of abrupt transitions and stuff, but that's clearly not what they want to do in that moment. They want to embrace that moment. They want to extend it out. They, they they want to do the cool thing. And they refuse to allow it to happen. And this is a continuous problem across the record. Yeah, no, it's... It's, it's a pathologic behavior. Really. <laughs> it um, is. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't... I. Yeah, I wish I could like sit down and be like, "Hey guys, what's going on?" It, it's okay to just feel the feelings and to yeah, like you yeah you don't you don't have, you don't have to bottle it up, man. You don't have to like, prove that you're okay. tough. It doesn't, make, <laughs> it doesn't make you any less of a man. You did that for the past fifteen years. You can just like embrace this. But yeah. I mean, that really comes down to uh, I mean, I mean, well, there I guess is another question: is is the issue? not the failure to commit to the emo parts, but maybe it's just the sticking too hard to the kind of worm rot format for the grind parts. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we still want to, to, yeah. Okay. So we want, we want to have this more melodic record, something a little more emotional, something a little more, uh, cathartic and, and I don't know, dare I say beautiful. And, but we still want to grind. But you you can grind within that framework. You There's established grind. ways to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's like they just fall back on what they know for the grind, which yeah. ends up yeah, which ends up blue balling you. Yeah, and you, it's... Can, you don't you don't have to drop out of that melody to start grinding, dude. You just you, you just grind. <laughs> yeah, you just put a blast beat under it. I yeah, mean, it just yeah. I mean, the things that they're interested in seem readily apparent. We were talking before the show. It's like they're listening to Swarm. They're listening mm-hmm. to Gridlink. They're listening to... Yeah, ex- definitely. They're listening to Old Screamo. They're listening to Orchid and shit like that. Yeah. Um, 
so there's already a template for how to execute this stuff in a way that makes sense and something the whole record like the aesthetic of it i mean from the cover art to the song titles is suggesting a certain kind of thing that maybe the old worm rot format just doesn't fit into anymore no i mean so yeah i mean it's interesting to bring up the album cover because i mean usually you know whatever album covers are cool i see a cool album cover i go okay i'll check out the band i'll admit it i've listened to tons of albums just because i thought i had cool art and i didn't know anything about the band yeah so it feels weird to bring it up still in context of the music but if you look at it i mean it's a great cover it's it's fucking, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful a, it's a really cool cover and like if and it would totally totally fit and and be indicative of the music more if if they really leaned in that melodicism um and so like yeah as you said it seemed like they totally had this idea in mind that they wanted to go that direction um and once again i think it's just they maybe they just felt they they couldn't you know have have the have the heavy parts without (laughs) without jumping back to to like the regular worm rot yeah Uh, well which is which is like that's you know that's that's not true no it's it's definitely it can still be heavy i mean like that you know and i i kind of brought this this out you know while listening to this album i was thinking about contrastic a lot Remember? yeah yeah that album there i mean it it kind of just keeps going with with very uh more sentimental melodic parts and the whole album is pretty intense oh yeah it's they a, it's a they really extreme record they do not sacrifice intensity or extremity but it's an extremely sentimental album. You know, like 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 you jokingly said, you know, why does this robot speak in my dead mother's voice? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's 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 legitimately like kind of uh, mournful music. But it it grinds and and blasts and you know, you can have you can have both. You can have it all. No, you know, yeah, no, I I fully agree. I guess and, they just felt safer or, or Yeah. Or, and well, here's Here's another example of that. Here's a track mm-hmm. called Sea of Disease. A track that is just, it's got such a wonderful opening. It even takes up most of the album. And <laughs> then it happens. You know, everybody says all the time, you know, it's the journey, it's not the destination. 
But if the destination for every one of your journeys is exactly the same place, it kind of makes you question the routing. Yeah, it's... Yeah, you know, and that... Damn, that's a pretty good allegory. Because, you know, it's like... Because <laughs> it's like... Uh, it, it's it's like they, they take these interesting little stops. They, like, take a stop to look at some beautiful scenery, and then they go back. It's It's almost like you go on a road trip, but point A and point B is just your house. Like, you leave home, you see some cool places, and then you go back home. Yeah. And like, like it's, it's, it's like they, they have these more interesting parts that almost exist as artifacts to bookend normal worm rot. Yeah. And if you're ever, if you're ever caught in a situation where every time you go on the road trip, everything out there is more interesting and more beautiful than everything at home fucking move yeah start re- reassess your living situation cuz that's just really depressing how's it going Connor here from Oncology and you're listening to Terminus all right next we have um it kind of, kind of a lightly anticipated album, at least from what I saw online, because you know people hear a sample track that sounds like this and they go, "Oh, whew, here we go." <laughs> um, Gre- Grenadier, trumpets blaze in burning glory. Trumpets um, blare in blazing glory. Excuse oh my me. god, I have that backwards. <laughs> oh my god, it was written. You know what? I wrote it wrong in the notes. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I read that instead of the. Oh my god. Oh. That's show's over. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, so so this this album is was immediately significant to a lot of people because from the first sample tracks that were released, it is um, Argo Slen worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they really really they obviously have listened to a lot of Argo Slen and said this is what we want to sound like and rolled with it. And uh, we're here to say, yeah, they, they did a good job. I, I think it sounds like Argo Slent, but a little different. They do, they do do their own thing. I got a, I got beef with some people online. I see a lot of people online because that's where I am most of the time. Because you know, <laughs> I'm I'm I I have no life. Uh, I see a lot of people online being like, oh well. It sounds a little too much like Argo Slen. Like you know, I've you know there this I hear riffs that I'm pretty, they just copy one to one from you know blah 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 Argo Slen song. But then I'm listening to this, I'm like, yeah, there's some riffs that I'm like, okay, yeah, that could be an Argo Slen. But then they do they 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 do their own thing with it, and I think it's cool. I think it's a good effect, and I think we should see. I want to see more more uh, people getting into Argo Slen making music like this. Well, it's it's interesting because I mean there is it feels just in the past couple of years uh, this huge wave of sort of like rediscovering Argusland, exactly, um, which is not something that really happened before, and in a lot of ways like the heyday of Argusland's popularity is kind of behind them. Um, I would say it probably peaked like late 2000s and then it became you know this kind of like secret handshake band for people that were really into underground stuff Mm -hmm. um and i I, there's a few possible reasons for that i mean one is obviously the political implications but another i would say is sort of the um i mean this this might be a leap but kind of the the rediscovery and the reigniting of sort of traditional heavy metal yes Um, i I was literally like, if you were if you were gonna go somewhere else, I was totally gonna bring up like this new the 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 quote unquote new wave of traditional heavy metal over this past decade has just slowly grown into like like it's it's a whole scene in of itself now. Yeah, so I think I think that what Arcos Lent was tapping into in a large part was guys who wanted a revitalization of stuff like uh, U.S. power metal. And now that thing is around. 
uh, over the past like five years, especially, there's been this massive resurgence oh, yeah. of traditional heavy metal and U.S. power metal. Um, so a lot of the people that were most attracted to that in Argus Lent's work have just gone over to that. But there is a niche of people who very specifically want to maintain the death metal qualities of that music. And I think that's where this sort of newer wave of bands finds themselves positioned. Um, so this was interesting for me to listen to because I'm not really much of an Argus Lent fan. Yeah, um, you, you, you like I, you're, you're the big Grand Belial's key guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I have not, I have not known you to really refer to or ever really talk about Argos Lent. If other people talk about it, you just kind of go, um, Grand Belial's key is more my thing, and then you move on. Yeah, well, I think for me, it's like, well, one, I mean, part of it is just because I got very tired of people talking about them back in the day. <laughs> um, it was just, it, sure. it, like, it, people talking about incorrigible bigotry was just like, it, it was just like any metal forum, there was just a thread about the album going on constantly. And it was just, and at that time in my life, I just really didn't have any interest in stuff that was kind of gesturing toward traditional heavy metal or anything like that. Uh, now that I'm a little bit older and I'm more into that stuff, I do understand, but still I've listened to stuff like incorrigible bigotry again over the years. It's still not exactly my thing, but I get it a lot more than I used to. Um, so now, uh, when we were talking about, you know, you filling in doing this episode with me, you were like, oh, you know, we could do the grenadier. I know you're not into that thing. It's like, well, you know, hold on. I'm interested to hear what, people in this vein are doing. Um, yeah. Because while I wasn't a huge Argos Lent guy, I am a huge fan of another guy that you mentioned in the notes, which is Migaus, which for many years yes. has been kind of the Argos Lent alternative to a lot of people. Yeah, that, that and like House of Atreus, which I, I never really totally got into them a ton because I think they stuck to a certain kind of Argo Slent riff that I wasn't ex as excited about. They're a little they bit more on the kind of like aggressive and... thrashy side too. Yeah, which is like fine, but it's like I want a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of stick to the but but yeah, Meek House, um, which I I never really tied to Argo Slent until there was one time you brought it up, and that kind of and I I never really thought about. It. I'm like yeah, it's almost like a like Argo Slent, but a little sad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, like it's it's, and it makes sense because it's like you know, it's about Migaus is about you know the the Algonquin people, and you know which barely exist anymore. Like, yeah, that is kind of sad. It's kind of fucked up. <laughs> um, very, very alternate to Argo Slent's uh, world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which which I which is why they're very very pop. You know, you it, there there's a there's a a. A group of people online who are very much, or well, I don't, I shouldn't say online. There's just a group of people in the world that are very into the idea of, I, I, ooh, it's it's like Argo Slent, but it's not racist. Which is funny because Migaus, I mean that uh, their 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 record is very old and was just like incredibly cult. Like you had to be yeah. very like deep reaches of the scene to have even heard of it. Oh, back yeah, in the I day. don't even remember. I. It was, I mean, as I told you, there was, like, a period of time where I would just, like, dig through Rate Your Music and Metal Archives to just, like, what's some weird shit that I've never even seen before, and, like, I'm gonna go listen to it. And I, I must have stumbled upon it at some point then, because, yeah, it was just like, oh, I've never seen this before, looks interesting, let's give it a go. Um, and, like, it's sick. And I, and as, as I kind of, you know, I dropped it in the notes because... I, the more I listen to this album with it in mind, I think it 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 has uh, more in common with Me Gauss than your average like Argo Slent worship band. Well, I think the distinction there is that I I think the general melodic character might be mm -hmm. more similar to Me Gauss, yes. but then the the very full incorporation of kind of like U.S. power metal and trad metal ideas is very yeah. Argo Slent. The the heavy metalisms are super Argo Slent. The melod the the melodies 
are much more and 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 i brought this i said this in the notes too they label themselves like they give themselves the tag like sentimental death metal (laughs) which i don't know i like at like first glance i'm like oh that's kind of lame isn't it but then i'm like well no it kind of is sentimental like it's got a it's got a certain like oh, I mean look at know, the album cover. Yo, it, yeah, and I was just gonna say it's like it's like a soldier writing a letter to his beloved. I mean it's or, like I mean that is a distinct thing, is like the album you know, uh Argoslin album covers are people in victory. You know, Grenadier's album cover is, you know, soldiers like a, dying. You yeah, don't it's see like, them. It's like a winning. forlorn yeah. charge. It's like yeah, a charge yeah. of the light brigade thing. Like you're doing it even though you're probably not gonna survive. Mm-hmm. And that's very, and that was the thing is, me Gauss definitely had a, a a a forlorn melancholy to a lot of it that it shares that like this album shares a lot with that, and it really is sentimental. So I get it. You know what? I and I feel I feel guilty for my initial uh, evaluation of that tag because it really is kind of sentimental. Yeah. That's okay. It's a the black metal guy's yeah, not here. Okay. He okay. can't yeah. hurt you. As we said, as, yeah. as we said with Wormrod, it's okay to feel those feelings. <laughs> like it doesn't make you less of a man. <laughs> well, you've got you've got something you wanted to bring up specifically as something differentiating this from Argos Lent, right? Um. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it that yeah, this first sample from Storm Attrition. Um, stood out to me as very uh, alternative melodic content to what you would expect from Argo Slend or a band trying to sound like Argo Slend. Um, so, as I, as I said, a storm attrition. So yeah, that that to me almost has like a like a like a a prideful sadness, almost like a, like sargeist. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a, there's like, definitely a quality where it's it, like a brooding. I mean, it, in a more direct sense, it also just echoes very straightforward Gothenburg stuff in a way. It's yeah, like there's, no, there, and there's slaughter of the soul is there, you know? Yeah, and that's that's and that's why I have beef. <laughs> like oh they're 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 just taking they're just like you know copying argo slent riffs and copy pasting them and well no because like argo slent's whole thing they're one of their big like the part of the big shtick is like oh it's mellow death but it's the it's the melodies coming from like u.s power where like gothenburg was just like we're gonna do death metal but it's like the most sentimental iron maiden you know yeah well it's a argos lent was you know even at their most melodic moments extremely tough sounding yeah it was it was yeah much yeah it was like a and that and that's kind of why you know people go like oh u.s power metal's better because it's like more manly and burly and because it has that 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 toughness to it you know jag panzer versus a halloween you know yeah yeah you know <laughs> as, as though that's like the only distinction to make you yeah know? right exactly like, but no, well, I, the, the meta, pe- people talking about music online are extremely reductive that's why there's terminus <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck off god we're the most reductive people out there yeah right Jesus. no um, um 
No, I, I, I get what you mean, though. It's like, and really, it does get back to that idea of a sentimental death metal. It's like there's... Exactly, there's, and... There's vulnerability to this stuff that Argus Lent would never allow themselves to engage with. Oh, no. In this, in fact, uh, like, next to the, the immediate impulse when listening to this album is like, yes, Argos Lent. Then I kind of go into, okay, I get some Meek House here. But the, um, I also hear, and I, I didn't put this in the notes because I'm just... I, I wasn't sure if it was significant enough to mention, but after listening to the sample again, I think it is. I hear a lot of... Um, there's a specific Goth, uh, Gothenburg band that I haven't seen get talked about a lot, but there's a sacrilege. Mm, um, okay. Probably doesn't get it talked a lot because people search sacrilege and they get the British crust band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's the Gothenburg band. They had this, um, Oh, this album, the fifth season that I really, really like, um, that has somewhat of a, a, a not dissimilar rhythmic character to maybe something like Argo Slim, but it's, you know, got the typical, very melancholic, uh, um, little gothy introspective kind of mellow death approach. But I, you know, I think this has enough in common with that. I think this is like, uh, I don't know, full spectrum mellow death. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, maybe maybe not maybe not full spectrum i mean there's there isn't enough emo in here for like vehement, vehemence or something but, <laughs> yeah well that's that's know. a that's a far outlier Oof. to the whole thing but if you want full spectrum mellow death you gotta acknowledge it oh uh, certainly but uh but yeah this this has a much more robust character than i think some listeners are giving it credit for Oh yeah, no, I I agree with that because there, I I I went back, uh, you know, right before we were, uh, started recording, you know, today I went back to incorrigible bigotry and uh, mm-hmm. you know I listened to a couple tracks and a couple tracks off off Hornets and uh, just to see if there were salient differences and there very clearly are there oh, there's yeah. substantial differences between this band and Argos Line. like the uh, their emphasis is actually pretty different in substantial ways and there's kinds of riffs that grenadier do which uh, you know i kind of alluded to before that argus Lent never would have um oh god no yeah and speaking of which let's get to a couple of those let's go to actually the the next track after yours commending the imperial um so we've had this sort of like joking term on the show of a uh, friendly cat black metal, which is uh, <laughs> stuff like Roster Chester, Totale Vernichtung, um, uh, Eyes in Winter. Winter. Yeah, yeah, these, these sort of like chirpy, uh, chirpy, punky NSBM that sounds yeah. more like Riot Girl than it does black yeah, metal. Yeah, it's, like, <laughs> it's got it's it, it's like a pop punk through an NSBM lens. Yeah, it's like it's like I always say, man, you like uh, Eyes in Winter, you should really check out tiger trap you do <laughs> they're a really sick fucking vicious nsbm band yeah, right. get them all listening to puzzle pieces and shit <laughs> um but uh here this might be the first instance i've ever heard of friendly cat death metal um so uh we're gonna listen to a sequence of riffs pay close attention to the second riff in this sequence which is the chirpiest thing i have ever heard on a death metal record. Thank you. 
so yeah, that that that, that little diminished dun 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 dun. dun. Um, what what's fascinating though is that they're sort of continuing the motif from the first riff, which is ironically that the opening riff of the sample is that's a like that's like a, a GBK riff. Very distinctly. That's not like an yeah, Argus Lent riff. It's, yeah. it's got that it's got that distinct like sourness. It's got that yeah, it's got that soured like Phrygian the spite. Yeah, yeah. It, it's got that. <laughs> but then you get that 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 friendly cat, really chirpy riff. It's clearly oh, from pop punk. It's it's sort of like a strung out riff or something, like a more technical take on pop punk. Yeah. Um, but then the right guitar is sort of extending and elaborating on that first riff. Some of the dual guitar shit going on in this album is ridiculously cool. Um, oh, just yeah. Like, super they, complex sort of harmonic interplay between both of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, Gilal would, you know, has probably broken too many skulls in Argentina to ever allow himself to write something like that. Yeah, so but, I, this, this but that's what makes it cool. Different. Yeah, that's yeah, what makes exactly. it cool is that you get a different side of this whole thing where you get this beautiful, you know, and you get to listen to it in both ears. On the left, you have this this beautiful, chirpy kind of like black and pop punk riff. And on the right, you've got this this much darker, more furtive yeah, sort of the, Phrygian riff. Yeah, and then they and they come together in this wonderful way. No, it's very it's it's extremely cool, extremely well written. And another thing that I want to emphasize is, uh, you know, after that, they get into that that brief blasting section, which, you know, kind of flips the switch on for a much darker, you know, much more sinister kind of sounding riff, which is something I want to emphasize across this record. Um, I feel like I am turning into the black metal guy and i'm like you know i like it when there's a little bit more conflict in the music and it's like <laughs> i don't just want to listen to the chirpy candy riffs all the time i want a little bit more conflict and i hate myself because i have become him <laughs> but it's, but it, it does it, it it makes those those it makes the candy a little sweeter yeah the the contrast i and i i think that across this record the the moments that i find the absolute best like that is one of my favorite moments on the record um is oh, based it's fantastic yeah it's based on the contrast of those moments and i would say that you know i'm i'm, I'm not a hundred percent sold on this whole style i have some misgivings that i'll get to at the end but i would say one of them is there are definitely moments and tracks on this that are just a little bit too contiguous in terms of you know their melodic quality it's just a little bit too continuously sweet um, but those mm -hmm. moments where they provide more of that contrast and moods and textures are immediately like rocket to the top of shit that I've heard this year. You know, it's like, clearly these are such sophisticated musicians. And I think the more they kind of challenge themselves to, uh, develop these really structurally intricate kind of melodic ideas like that, the better it's going to be. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of room for like really smart count like dual guitar almost like counterpoint ish stuff i mean everybody likes vehemence yeah that's yeah like, <laughs> that's like that's like the whole thing you know and you know give me an argos oh, actually that's that is that it is that this it's not that this is argos lent this is death metal chivalric black metal like french black metal because you can i mean uh, it, just saying it, 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 there's a lot of comparable stuff going on there there is the melodicisms are not dissimilar the the emphasis on the interplay between two guitar players you know i mean our argos Len, I, I yeah they had two guitar it wasn't just galal right i think they had two guitarists i believe they it had never two, yeah. it never stood out as like it's it's important that there's two guitars I and mean, yeah. there's always a lead line where in this there throughout the album it's very it's very um important to this like the structure of the song that there are two guitars playing uh related but different parts and uh that i mean that just makes the album cooler yeah so, and absolutely yeah, the and, the the, yeah, separ guess, the separation of them is crucial. 
Yes, yes, that, and, well, and it, it's like that specific part. They're doing their own thing. They come together to to make sweet love, <laughs> and, then they, and then they do their own thing again, and it's, um, I didn't really have a, anywhere that thought was going. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like, but, uh, you know, the, I, I know that you and I have talked about the idea. I think what you're getting at is, um, I kind of said it when we reviewed the uh, the new GBK this year, which is like a lot of GBK is actually kind of rooted in, you know, prog rock technique, you know, um, n- maybe not so much technically as far as like individual instruments, but structurally the, the mm, way that, Oh, like story, like musical story. Yeah. The very sort of rock opera, like rush type stuff. And I, having, I get a similar sense to a lot of the stuff on this record. Well, yeah, it, well, it's, it's about having movements. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I guess it's not necessarily. I mean, maybe it comes from prog rock, or maybe it just comes from you know, a lot of extreme metal dudes uh, tend to have an appreciation, or at least you know, some of the cooler ones are like in the '90s for sure had an appreciation for classical music mm-hmm. and and non non standard song structures like non pop song structures. And one of the easiest places to go for that is, you know, more classical orchestral music because it functions on movements. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I can see that in this. And, you know, to try and tie it in with Veyamance more again, if Veyamance does that um, in a lot of songs, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have their main theme and go off and do other stuff and go into this and then come back, revisit it. Uh yeah, the the sort of core refrain structure. Yeah, you know the, the you know not in the sense of a chorus like a pop song, but a a, a sort of home position for the uh, the track to return to. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not it's not it's somewhere between a traditional song structure and then played through. You know. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. yeah that that definitely feels. Um, to me, very very classical, but yeah, I can totally see it as coming from prog rock too. Yeah. Um, well, so so in terms of in terms of differentiation and riffing, um, you know, just because I I'm definitely not as well versed in Argus Lent's riffing style as you are, like how how would you try to articulate some of the the substantial changes? There? Yeah. So one of the biggest one, and I mean. I'm not going to go through and pick every time I heard a riff where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, this Argo Slant riff, I know. Like, you, there are times you hear the beginning of a riff, it sounds like an Argo Slant riff, Argo Slant riff, and you start to expect how it's going to resolve, and it doesn't resolve in that way. And this this one in particular on the Levant Sultanate, which uh, the riff very much feels like something straight out of... uh, Oh, it's a specific song on Incorrigible Bigotry. It's the third song on the album. I always forget the name of it. Uh, here it is. <laughs> que- uh, uh, forgive me. Quelling the Simeon Surge. Mm, yeah, uh-huh. um, yeah, off that album, there's this particular kind of uh, playful, almost nautical kind of riff. Mm-hmm. That uh, I don't know why I think nautical, but I always come back to nautical for Argo Slend. It kind of has that vibe to it, but uh, it kind of resolves in a completely different way than you expect. Thank you. 
yeah. So to me, that first riff in my head, it expects it to go like like to kind of keep going with that. Yeah. Um. They but it does a like. Yeah, they, I, I know, it's, it's, that is that is a distinction from Arcos Lent. They they tend to do a lot of these more like what they're really invested in super distinct A B variations uh, on the yes. endings of their riffs, and uh, these guys seem to like to lead with the big held chord version, and then leave the the yes. big kind of flashy turnaround to the B variation, uh, which is sort of the reverse that you would typically see from a lot of these kind of melodeath structured riffs where you want the uh the uh you want the big held chord variation at the very end of the riff to bring the intro in again like a hammer you know yeah and i just <sighs> with argus slent they tend to just kind of keep going with that like i like i said kind of shanty ish uh melodicism and there's a more contiguous sense of rhythm that's that's another thing <laughs> yeah, to bring up yeah. for this band which is like uh it's not super flashy but there's a lot of really subtle drumming stuff that drives a lot of these songs yeah they they a lot of, a lot of the differences outside of you know what we've already highlighted are just small little things dropped in here and there like a little twist of a riff a way they're doing it just a little different than what you might expect if you're a person who has listened to a lot of Argus Slent and is expecting a certain of oh, certain riffs to go certain ways, and they don't, they don't go the ways you're expecting them to. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with a. Uh, I mean, Argus Lent was obviously doing this to a large degree, but Grenadier possibly even more is really embracing the kind of rock and roll thing that's inherent to a lot of these melodic ideas. I oh, mean, yeah. cl- clearly they're listening to Iron Maiden in a very serious way. But they're also just listening to a lot of you know blues rock stuff. In oh no, the way yeah, they there, form there's the like there, there's a little there's a little bit of groove and boogie here and there. Not not like a not like a boogie woogie, but like, a, like <laughs> only a, 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 a single like, boogie, <laughs> maybe just a single boogie or like a, kind of a jam quality to it. Yeah, you definitely get the sense that these are songs that are refined in the practice space. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, for a very they, long they, time, they, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's that that very organic sense of uh, you know little little stops, little like uh, I, I I've noticed they like to do um, sort of halting um, half repetitions of riffs to announce the full version. I think that happens at the end of that sample there. Uh, yeah, just these kind of cool ideas that you wouldn't get just writing it in your room on your no, own, yeah, on these, guitar. these guys, these guys play as a band together as a unit. Yeah. It's a okay, very intense, full band energy, full band energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for my last sample, uh, I'm going to go to the title track. And so, so my, what are my, my critiques of this style? I would say for this record in particular, I would say actually the weakest points of this album for me are the ones that are the most closely hewn kind of rhythmically to trad metal. Um, I, I think there's moments, uh, there's like a pretty distinct one in like the, uh, the opening track atrocity cycle where, uh, there's a very simple kind of palm muted syncopated heavy metal riff. Um, Uh, And it's the kind of thing that recurs a few times across the record, um, which is fine if we were in the 80s and you were using clean vocals. So there's another melodic dimension to kind of carry it. But yeah, in this case where we're using a a kind of like, uh, you know, uniform death metal grunt across it. There's nothing to really carry those moments. So there's a few places across this record where there's these kind of things that are gesturing toward like old speed metal or old US power metal, but they end up feeling kind of like holding patterns. They don't feel like they're really developing the songs. Yeah, they're just Um, sending you to the next cool moment. Yeah, they're just kind of hovering. It's a place for lyrics. It's, you know, it's a place Mm -hmm. to hang out and it's not bad, but it's it's clearly not what these songs are built on. They could have been doing something with it. 
Exactly. And I think in a lot of cases, they could have just cut them out and just kept the more dense racing parts, and it might have been tighter and stronger as a result. So I want to play the the opening of Trumpets, Blair, and Blazing Glory, um, which I think is just a, a perfect example of what this band can do when they're firing on all cylinders, where they're using the melodic ideas of U.S. power metal and trad metal, um, but not necessarily feeling the need to use the structural conceits of that style and just the opening of this song is just a a sequence of phenomenal interlocking riffs uh and i would just i hope the following record is basically this sort of thing continuously So yeah, that 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 whole sequence there blew my fucking head off when I heard it the first time, and it and it continues to do so now. Um, just it, it's it's such a wonderful way all those riffs interlock with each other. I love the sort of um, irregular length and structure of the riffs. You know, they they are not yeah. all the they're they're certainly as the black metal guy would say not grid written at all. They're they're very unique. No, there's yeah. a certain and and this was always something with Argus Slam is there's a certain like syncopation mm-hmm. that um just it gives a very distinct quality to your usual any kind of death metal riffing, let alone just melodic death metal. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like like we were both pointing out um, listening to that. That wonderful, like, bluesy guitar guy flourish. Mm-hmm. That dun 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 You like know? That, that could be a dude in, like, a denim jacket and a cowboy hat. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and, shit. like, yeah. you were, I, I was describing it as similar to, like, an Eisenhand thing. And you would say, well, even going back, that's, like, the first Iron Maiden record. That's, that yeah. is early, early heavy metal where blues was still an essential part of the character oh, yeah. you you had the you had the melodicisms going into the new wave of british heavy metal but yeah you they still they were still listening to like you know the uh, blue cheer and thin lizzie and stuff yeah and i think that's one of the coolest things that's been rediscovered i mean obviously i love the uh the modern sort of revival uspm and uh <clears throat> traditional stuff but to a degree that had already existed you know there were always bands like say twisted tower dire that were playing oh yeah within that general idea but what they didn't have was that kind of blues boogie stuff that you get from the very earliest heavy and speed metal well yeah because um, you have the these people exploring you know the whole gamut of music from like you know 77 to 85 of what you know heavy metal during this period and yeah like and you know you look with the eisenham thing that's not you know that's not something that was really explored a ton until recently 
yeah. And it's and you it comes out with some ridiculously good albums, and now we have, well, what if you know, when we went bluesy with the death metal. This is a little one gash, and you're listening to Terminus. All right, we are back with our final record of the night, and uh, for the first couple records, we've been talking about you know emotion and melody and influences from things like emo and traditional heavy metal. Well, we, we can just sweep all of that off the table like a uh, like a business drama from the 80s or something because we've got something that runs against all of that, which is the second full length from Numa Hagion titled Demiurge. Uh, this is coming out on a CD on Meet 5000 Records. Um I, I think it's possible that Nuclear War Now is still handling the vinyl. I'll have to check in with R on that. Yeah, that. Yeah, um, that's kind of I, that. I thought that was kind of weird because they were saying like, "Oh, vinyl out in what, like b- December?" Oh uh, yeah, but vinyl is backed up everywhere. Like, well, like and six months from now. my understanding, uh, from from what I've heard, uh, Nuclear War Now is also tends to be backed up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to modern metal labels and production. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but the CDs, I believe, are out now, and it's also obviously available on Bandcamp. Um, so we covered the first Numa Hagion full length in 2020, titled Void Gazer. It was one of my favorite records of the year, and I'll just uh, repeat my general disclaimer: uh, R, the main person behind Numa Hagion, is a guy that I've been talking to on and off for probably like 15 years now something like that uh you know we've we've always talked about music we've collaborated on stuff here and there over the years so you know there's there's that slant to anything i say um so void gazer in 2020 was uh honestly i just think it was, it was a phenomenal record it's honestly of uh of ours many many projects that he's been a part of i think just one of the best um, and for those who aren't familiar, uh, Numa Hagion basically plays a sort of incredibly heavy downtuned death metal, the primary influence of which is like mid era morbid angel, like circa gateways to annihilation with little bits of inflection from, um, sort of like uh, primal U.S. Black Death stuff, you know, Profanatica type things. But ultimately, the sound is all its own. Uh, uh, Shaman, I think you you listened to this one a fair amount when it came out, uh, Void Gaze, or like, is there any other... Oh, I mean, I, I still it? listen yeah. to it regularly. Oh, I do too. I, of, I still listen of, to it all the dude, time. Dude, Summoning is one of my favorite songs to put on when I'm peeling out of the parking lot after a bad, a hard day at work. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I want to be pissed off and angry about having to work <laughs> for a living. It is awful, isn't it? <laughs> oh God! Um, but yeah, no, Void Void Gazer. I I still regularly listen to um, because I mean I'm personally the the Steve you know uh, Steve Tucker Morbid Angel, mm-hmm. especially yeah, Gateways to Annihilation and uh, Formulas Fatal to the Flesh. I I mean to me that's peak Morbid Angel, like Platonic Ideal. I know you're mm-hmm. more of a you really like Covenant. Uh, um, that's I know that's you, probably my also, favorite, but I like all of it. Basically. Yeah, but you're also a gateways guy. But yeah, like I gateways and formulas are like my peak, my platonic ideal of what I want Morbid Angel to sound like. Mm-hmm. And um, so th- this stuff is you know absolute a feast to me. As I I made a a buffet filling up my plate at the buffet analogy in um in the notes because <laughs> God, I just I could I could do this all day. Well, it's also, it's also been interesting because it feels like just over, I mean, I, I'm sure it was happening before, but especially over the past couple of years, it feels like there's been a very serious critical reevaluation of formulas and gateways that has basically yeah. placed them alongside, you know, the, the classic Morbid Angel albums as, you know, being yeah, where equal they belong. to them. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. I mean, those are phenomenal well, it's, records. And- yeah. I think definitely gateways in particular, or formulas, formulas in particular, um, 
I think there's there's a there's a whole strain of death metal, especially a lot of death metal in like the early two thousands that pulls from that kind of morbid angel that kind of has been lost in the past decade in favor of more incantation or autopsy sounding stuff Mm -hmm. you know everyone wants their death metal to be like maybe a little slow kind of gross and grungy um but you know there was bands like um like christian or diabolic or uh god what was the one i was listening to the other day that was super fucking sick but uh there, there were a lot more bands that kind of did the Morbid Angel thing, and it's really cool just to see bands now in this in this age of like Maggot Stomp and and Dark Descent and Twenty Bucks Spin to see bands doing stuff that sounds like Morbid Angel. So I'll eat, I'll eat it up. I love it. I could, as I said, I could do it all day. Yeah, certainly. You know, like fuck it, man. Anymore. <laughs> Well, and so so now we have Demiurge. We've got the second full length after, you know, a, a long series of, uh, you know, demos and EPs and stuff like that. Um, so and it's it's kind of interesting because there is a way to see Void Gazer in which it is. It's I mean, it's sort of a perfect record, like in terms of nailing its aesthetic conceit. I don't really know what could have gone better for it. You know, it's just like... No, it says exactly what it wants to say in the exact amount of time necessary. Exactly. As I said, 25 minutes is perfect. Yeah, so so how do you you continue from there? Um, And it seems like on Demiurge, well, it's kind of a lateral move. So Void Gazer and Numa Hagion in general is down such a, you know, a needle point specific kind of aesthetic rabbit hole, it's hard to progress in a traditional way from there. Because a lot of what New Mahagion does is, you know, addition through subtra- subtraction. You know, it's it's about, you know, carving away the excess to create this, you know, this 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 steel hard core of pure death metal energy. Um so what do we have on Demiurge? Well, f- in a large part, more of the same, which is, you know, really what we want. <laughs> you know, I mean, Numa Hagion is performing in a niche that nobody else is really accessing. Uh, however, there are some subtle but distinct differences. Uh, one thing that was really important on Void Gazer, and then when I interviewed R on the show in the wake of that album, was this distinct sense of um, sort of beat down hardcore, uh, which upon talking to him, it seems that he arrived at sort of accidentally. Um, Cause that's not really something that he listens to very much. Um, Demiurge, seems to respond to that in a way in that that sort of sound is less present. This is much more of a pure death metal record, at least, uh, at least at first blush than maybe void gazer was. Um, the yeah. End- I mean, and yeah. he, he, Oh, and he kind of said in the interview, he kind of pulled that from just like morbid angel or suffocation. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I- and, and, and yeah, morbid angel has its own, you know, speaking of gateways, its own sort of slow down moment. But it is very interesting that he took it in Numa Hagion and made it just a, you know, vicious, mean chug <laughs> there. You know, Trey, Trey Azicto would have done, you know, like a little like, you know, like over, over. You would have thrown down. a little trill in. Or yeah, yeah. You know? Where R just goes. <laughs> you know, like beating like, you with a hammer. It's like, listen, man, you so, can you can say it all came from gateways, but I never wanted to spin kick a child in the face. In no, the yeah, I, 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 I never <laughs> wanted to, you know, uh, obliterate an, an, a stand. You know, what 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 did I say? obliterate a smaller concert goer you know it's definitely it's definitely music to prey on people people weaker than you in the pit too yeah absolutely as Um, as the archons do upon our souls exactly so um so uh, certainly that element is still there there's still huge pit riffs but in general i would say the pace of this album is a little bit faster and yeah um 
structurally, this music is very similar to the first record in that these are very short, very compact songs, generally based around a single pivotal moment. But in this case, the pivotal moment is not always a very distinct breakdown in the way that it kind of was on Void Gazer. Mm. Um, this is, in a sense, maybe less immediately distinct, but perhaps more appealing to mainline death metal people than Void Gazer would have been. Where Void Gazer is for this specific cross section of people obsessed with both Gateways and Zabalba. <laughs> you know? like, but uh, I, I, I've talked about it long enough. I mean, what's what's your overall impression of this uh, comparing it to Void Gazer? Yeah, I think. Much more of the interesting rhythmic ideas exist in in the faster parts, whether they're blasts or the the kind of polka tupa tupa, you know, bits. Mm-hmm. I don't. Yeah. I never have a I never have a good word for those, so I just say polka. No, yeah, I guess. tupa tupa, two, yeah, <laughs> two stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, God knows ours musical lineage has plenty of gore grind tupa tupa. Yeah. It, so. No, exactly. So yeah, you know what? For him, we'll call it a tupa tupa. Um, yeah, and, and I found the parts that really brought me in rhythmically were much more in the faster parts than slower. I mean, there were still some cool parts, um, you know, very, very, you know, homicidal, you know, breakdowns, uh, <laughs> which, you know, we can, you know, if we want to roll into that first sample, we can find here, uh, yeah, let's hypo- do it hypostasis of the archons let's let's show people the the essence of numa hagan for those who unfortunately didn't hear the first record yep So yeah, that yeah. It, it, dude, I, I I I I'm gonna have to do another interview with him after this record. And it's just like, are like, you sure? Are, are you, are you sure? gonna tell me you didn't do that with the intent to create a crowd kill part in your death metal yeah. song? Like, <laughs> there, you have to be aware of the violence you're inciting. <laughs> you're writing you're, a part, you're, writing you're, a part in your song like that. A, a breakdown like that is a hate crime in most states. <laughs> <laughs> like jesus christ man but but yeah that is that is a great just depiction of the two general modes of numa hagion you know um i mean you can describe i mean it is very distinctly that sort of it's it's 75 percent morbid angel 25 percent incantation you know yeah and and but that incantation is titrated down into you know incantation the slow parts you'll have you know these kind of more meandering riffs uh more interesting stuff going on musically i guess it's more specifically doom really yeah but but numa hagion gets very slow but it never really gets doomy it it, but yeah so they titrate that slowness down into just and it's like yeah that's you 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 did it that's all you needed yeah i mean it, it, any it, better. so you trimmed off the fat and just got you the part that makes you want to kill it really finds the i mean you know me and the black metal guy have talked on the show so many times about you know the interaction between like brutal death metal and beat down hardcore and down tempo especially mm-hmm. and it's almost as though in numa hagion our f- traces a theoretical route where you get to down tempo through death metal exclusively yeah completely circumventing the brutal death yeah so circumventing that and circumventing traditional hardcore in any sense yeah and the beatdown 
Yeah, yeah, it's just like it's yeah, you, he went he he went straight from Morbid Angel. Yeah. Yeah, you just simplify it to the point where you're left with just giant ringing open notes forever. Yeah, it's know? like what if what if Trey wasn't a guitar guy and didn't have to put in fancy stuff in the slow parts? It's, and it's, was a, what if he was content with just chugging? What 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 if winter was about murdering people in the crowd instead of like feeling desolate? You know? Exactly. <laughs> no, it's a it's fascinating, and that's a you know that's a good instance of you know sort of like peak Numa Hagion operating in its traditional modes. Exactly. Um, and then from there, I think we're going to get to stuff that's a little bit more essential to this record in particular. Um, so real quick, uh, we'll talk some more, but I want to do kind of a compare and contrast. We're going to go to the song Death Crowned, um, mm-hmm. so, which is, to me, like the summoning of this record. Oh, because- absolutely. No, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the oh, minute, God. the minute, like, as I said, usually I have trouble parsing lyrics, but I heard these lyrics. Oh, and yeah. The minute I heard it, I'm like, oh, yeah. I had to write them in all caps, bold on the sheet. <laughs> So as as soon as I saw that, I'm like, yeah, okay, I know exactly what song you picked here. Yeah, so that is, and that is a distinct thing about Numa Hagion. R has made it very clear that he wants the lyrics to be extremely audible and distinct. It's it's kind of remarkable the vocal performance he's pulled off that's so guttural and so roaring, but still so legible. Um, very, very, he he enunciates way more than than your average death metal. Vocalist. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how the hell he does it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to have him do some guest work for me. Clearly, um, yeah. yeah can you... But here are the big lines on Death Crown, and we were talking when we covered Boy Gazer. It's like it's amazing how many of the lyrics on Numa Hagion stuff are just cool death metal lines just in isolation they would be yeah, the sickest sick shit on the planet. <laughs> yes and so for death crown the the pivotal lines are it was for me that your ancestors were sacrificed it was for me that they were bound and strangled it was for me that men were drowned in the bogs it was for me that the victims were tortured so let's listen to fucking death crown <laughs> It's a, no, yeah, it's not, it's not, we're not talking about, like, abstract situations or, like, yeah. describing actions, like, oh, like, oh, I, this guy came and, like, murdered this dude, or there's a monster. No, he's just, he's telling you. Yeah, he's yeah. Declaring to you. Oh, man. Now the, you will worship me. The proclamations <laughs> that he writes Exa- in yeah. his goddamn death metal songs are so sick. That's like the essence of death metal to me is like big ass proclamations of power and evil. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, but, but yeah, so, so what's interesting is like the, um, in contrast, Voidgazer, the pivotal moments 
aren't like i mean obviously this opens with this unbelievable crowd kill breakdown thing oh but then, yeah the the dudes are starting to rev up in the pit they're getting yeah you're doing you're doing the the windmill thing with one arm as you're yeah, looking to ready. uppercut someone's girlfriend and shit um, <laughs> but uh but yeah but then it's like the huge vocal moments are across blast beats mm-hmm. um And a lot of the biggest moments on this record are actually across blast beats. Uh, I'm not going to say that the tempo of this record is necessarily higher than Void Gazer, but it seems like the big points of emphasis are really on faster moments. Yes, the focus is on faster parts. There's definitely much more emphasis on the fast trem riffs and just kind of and how they move the movement in them. Yeah, because like Void Gazer, I mean, the fast trem riffs were cool, but they were definitely like space fillers in a sort of like mortician sense. Like they're yeah. they're cool riffs, but they don't really have individual meaning. They they stand in as a certain kind of riff. Um, here, it feels like they're a little bit more considered. Like there's there, there's a little bit more meaning imbued in individual trem riffs. Yeah, they. Oh. Sorry, some stuck in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably evil. Is it evil? Yeah. Oh my god! No, it's it's just it's a blood clot. Um, <laughs> no, um, oh god! You know, I just start like puking blood from listening to this music. Um, no, yeah, it's there's definite focus on the you know, actual intervals used and how these notes move. Like, I, well, like I said, for, for the next sample, for Seven Sacrifices, how these uh, parts, not so much the individual notes, but the relationship between the notes and how they move and writhe and pulsate you know, I the first thing I thought of is yeah how it relates to maybe something like DB, where mm, yeah. it's it's a lot of times very atonal, but it's very much about that like pulsing, almost breathing, of of the riff. Yeah, certainly. Like the, you can definitely tell no, that you you can definitely tell on this record that there are sort of idiomatic rhythmic guitar ideas that are central to this project. Yeah, yeah, I feel like the rhythm in general is a lot more important because I mean a lot a lot of the riffs going on aren't super super complicated, you know, they or they're melodically tight. You know, if you uh, they're not he's not moving up and down the neck on the guitar it's like very very ton. deliberately. It's very tight. Yeah. Yeah, restrained, but it's how he's, you know, doing, you know that that whoa, whoa, the 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 pulsing of it yeah yeah um, is just like so intense in those blasts So, like, there, there's a certain, oh, uh, like, snake-like quality to the riff, and it's not even, while, while the melody's cool and all, I feel like how that melody is moving is equally, if not more, important in this music. No, I agree. Um, there, there, something, the way these riffs are constructed is 
very different from most extreme metal riffing. It almost seems like the the important thing isn't the melodic intervals it is the the rhythmic spacing within them which i mean which is basically what you said but it's like the it's almost as though you could have a single trem riff for this entire record and the 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 note that's held on to a little bit longer is like the informing part of it like that that dictates the meaning of the riff you know, is it at the the peak ascent up the intervals? Is it on the way up? Is it on the mm, way down? So yeah, like what, what? It's the same exact riff, but you're changing what you're holding. Yeah, no, that that totally makes sense. Yeah, and there's obviously like different riffs, but you definitely get that sense of, um, you know, these are all just like viciously chromatic kind of. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's mortician, there's cryptopsy, there's cataclysm, there's morbid angel in all these intervals. But ultimately, what makes them distinct are the rhythmic figures that live within them. Yes. <laughs> no. Yeah. Than that, I mean, I don't. I don't really have a ton else to say about the riffs, other than that. It's just that very, that super, super rhythmic emphasis. Yeah, and and the the deliberate restriction of it, like you like you were yeah. saying, the, the the tight constraint in like the number of fret, like I could I could see him consciously saying something like, nothing will ever go above the seventh fret on this album, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> the, and it doesn't need to. Yeah, it it doesn't need to because it's about these these sinuous serpentine looping patterns within these very constrained like you know maybe an octave and a half space no yeah, yeah it's it's like the whole album is just variations on a theme oh yeah i mean which is which is kind of similar to void gazer and what i assume really that new mahagan will do forever is going to be variations on this theme. I, I i don't think this is a project that is going to see a a big uh a big a big progressive there he's not going to pull a worm rot at any point in the future you know no i, I wouldn't think so it's going to be variations on this concept um but then there are things that have been kind of added in and uh things with a little bit more emphasis so i want to go to the track holy silence um so something that may have been present on void gazer but if it was i never really paid a lot of attention to was kind of grindy d-beat stuff uh, which is present on this record, and it it has like pretty significant moments dedicated to it. And I wasn't sure about it the first time I listened to the record, just because um, it at first blush it seems at odds with the with the kind of like uh, thematic dimensions of this music and its presentation overall. These kind of like monolithic slabs, you know, doing a D beat seems like almost too fun or something. But then listening, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like this. This is too upbeat. Yeah, it's like this isn't making me want to fucking murder someone. Like, what is this doing here? Um, but then listening to it some more, I was like, okay, I kind of like the way this paces things out, and it sort of breaks up the monotony of the music. And I say monotonous in a positive way. It's you know deliberate and it's justifiable. There's a point to it. Um, but to just create this kind of like mid-range bridge between the slow breakdowns and just the, the really fast blasting parts, I think it's kind of neat. And Holy Silence in particular pulls this off in a way that I want to talk about.
So yeah, it's a it's a relatively short section there, but it's something that recurs a few times throughout that song. That that D beat section, which is, I mean, th- that whole thing sounds more intricate than it is. There's really only like two riffs that are played. You know, it's well, just and but that's rhythmic what rhythmic variations, that, yeah, and that's what makes it particularly D beat over crust is the fact that it's just like it's like two riffs. Yeah, and it's you know, it's just like you've got a trem version, you got a palm muted version, you got a D beat version. Yeah, but it's all the same but, thing. But I think that it's perfect to have like a little bit of a grindy D beat kind of thing going on because it all serves the purpose of this is like so much about rhythm. So it's yeah. D beat. It comes back to like that 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 breathing, pulsating quality to the riff, you know that's that's what it's all about with stuff like db yeah and it's um i i don't know it's there is something fascinating about accessing that sort of like if if void gazer is a record that only operates in two modes it's it i mean really that whole album is blast beat or down tempo breakdown Mm -hmm. um this adds a sort of medium space that I mean, it, it, it's a weird thing to say that that's like a big progression, but it kind of is. It's adding an entirely new dimension to this music. And in music that relies like, in a sense, almost exclusively on rhythm to kind of carry it, rhythm and timbre, really. I mean, Numa Hagion, in a, in a large sense, has more to do with enmity than it does like regular death metal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. You know, I, I yeah, think yeah. of it that way. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's music of pure rhythm and timbre. I mean there are riffs, but in the sense that grave upheaval has riffs, you know. Yeah, it's, it's just... not it's it's it, not primary. It's not necessarily important. Like it's fun, but you know it's not primary to the music. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, and I I think really you just saying that that's like that's what makes New Mahagion special is that it is. It, it's it's post death metal, you know. It's it's death metal where the riff yeah. is not the defining element. It is music of pure rhythm and timbre. And just knowing R for so many years, I can see the, I can see hemorrhage in this, and I can see last days of humanity in this, and I can see tons of noise and power electronics in this. It is, in a sense, one of the primary summations of his musical career is is really this band and i i just i am so excited for you know 20 years from now when people look back to new mahagian and realize that this was the start of something tremendous well yeah it's they they you're you're looking at some of the most extreme things to come out of brutal death and it's just pushing it out through the original death metal lens. And that's brilliant. 